So I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to the Gospel according to Mark. Mark chapter 2. And I am most excited for the text that we will look at today. If you're visiting, you need to know we're involved in a verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of Mark. We find ourselves in Mark chapter 2. And today we will focus upon verses 13 and 14. The title of the message today is Suddenly Converted. The Word of God reads, And he, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ, went out again by the seashore. And all the people were coming to him. And he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. Several centuries ago, a number of workmen were seen dragging a large marble block into the city of Florence, Italy. The large marble block had come from the very famous quarries of Carrara, Italy, and was intended to be formed into a statue of one of the great Old Testament prophets. But when the great sculptor Donatello saw this block of marble, he immediately refused it. It contained obvious imperfections, he said. And so there it lay in the cathedral yard, a flawed and useless block of marred marble. Then one day, another sculptor caught sight of it. This skilled craftsman examined it, and he clearly saw the imperfections. But there flashed into his mind something of immense beauty in the, in the marble. And he saw that this flawed block of marble, he saw what it could become. And he resolved to sculpture it, imperfections and all. And so for the next two years, this great sculptor, this great artist, worked feverishly on this once rejected rock. And finally, on January the 25th, 1504, the greatest artists of the day of the Renaissance gathered to see the public unveiling of this once despised and rejected piece of marble that had now been made into a statue. And among those assembled there that day to witness the public unveiling was Leonardo da Vinci and Monticello and the renowned teacher of Raphael, Pietro Perugino. And the veil was dropped to the floor, and the statue was unveiled, and it was met with immediate praise. It was instantly recognized and acclaimed as a masterpiece. And the succeeding centuries have confirmed that that initial judgment was correct. The sculptor's name was Michelangelo, and the statue is one of the most famous pieces of art in the entire world. It is the famous statue of David. Michelangelo saw what others could not see. And Michelangelo looked beyond the flaws and looked beyond the imperfections of this block of marble and he saw what could be made of it, and Michelangelo applied himself, and it was transformed, and it has become an acclaimed masterpiece. This is precisely what the Lord Jesus Christ delights in doing with flawed and ruined sinners. He delights in taking imperfect lives that have been devastated and defiled by sin, And He looks beyond the sin to what His grace can make of that life. And He delights in transforming people like us into great works of His grace. Christ delights in taking those whom others have passed over and to make something beautiful of our lives. 
He delights in taking those whom others have rejected, whom others have refused, and to make us trophies of His grace. Christ sees not what they see. Christ sees what His grace can make of us. In Ephesians 2, verse 10, Paul says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. When the Apostle Paul used this word, workmanship, that is what we are. We are His workmanship. It is a Greek word that means literally a masterpiece. A great piece of art. A magnificent poem or painting. A tapestry. This is what we are by the grace of God. And the Lord delights in taking people like us who are far more flawed and far more ruined by sin than what we could ever imagine and transforming us by His grace into the very image of Himself. This is what the word conversion means. The word conversion means the act of changing. Changing something into another form. It is the act of turning something into something else. And just as Michelangelo changed and converted a block of marble into a beautiful statue, so the Lord delights in converting sinners into saints. And those who are defiled like a tax collector like Matthew into a trophy of His grace. Now, before we look at this text, which is only two verses today, I think that this is a golden opportunity for us to talk just for a moment about the doctrine of conversion. The doctrine of conversion. Conversion is one side of the coin of the act of salvation. The other side of the coin is regeneration. Regeneration is the new birth. And that is the divine side of the coin. That is God's work. And it blows like the wind. It is a sovereign, supernatural work of God that only God can do. And that is one side of the coin. And the other side of the coin is conversion, which is man's side. Man's responsibility. Regeneration is God's work. Conversion is man's response. And it is the heads and tails of exactly the same coin. And it is regeneration that precedes conversion. And it is regeneration that produces conversion because God is always previous. Regeneration is the supernatural, sovereign work of God in the spiritually dead soul of the center, sinner, implanting eternal life and implanting saving faith and implanting the gift of repentance in the soul of the spiritually dead sinner. Conversion is the acting out of what God has placed in through regeneration. Conversion is sinful man exercising this God-given repentance and this God-given faith to turn away from sin and to turn to the Savior. Conversion is a change of life direction. Conversion is a turning point. Conversion is the turning away from sin and a turning to Christ. Conversion is a forsaking of the old sinful life and a following now of a new sinful, of a new holy life. Conversion is the putting off of the old man and a putting on of the new man that begins the moment, the moment of conversion. It is a change of life direction that involves a fleeing from sin and a following after Christ. 
This is a very important doctrine. It is not the same as the new birth. The new birth is what only God can do. You cannot cause yourself to be born again. And it is the work of God in the new birth that brings about the conversion that you and I participate in. Let me tell you why this is so important. When I was in Germany two Sundays ago, I preached what I preached here three weeks ago, which is Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And you will see in verse 5 where Jesus said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. And I preached for an hour on the forgiveness of sin that comes through Christ alone. And He alone has authority to forgive human sin. After church was over, I went to lunch with the missionary who was hosting me and he invited his mother and father to come. And so we all went to lunch there in Germany as I was looking for a Burger King someplace. (laughs) And as we sat, the missionary's mother asked me a question. The father was unconverted. She has recently come to know the Lord. And she said, you said that God forgives all sin. You said that God, when you're saved, forgives all of the sin for the rest of your life. And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, are you not afraid if you tell someone, like, tell someone that all of their sin is forgiven that they will then live in sin the rest of their life? And I said, ma'am, the doctrine of forgiveness of sin is inseparably bound with 50 other doctrines. One of which is the doctrine of conversion. And whenever someone is saved, they are converted. I go to Germany, I have an American $5 bill, I hand it to the bank, and they give me German money back. That is a conversion, a transforming from one to another. And when someone is saved, they turn away from sin and it is the beginning of a new life where for the rest of their life they are burning their bridges behind them and they are forsaking sin and they are following after Jesus Christ and anyone who has truly been saved is converted. There's no such thing as fire insurance without conversion. And if you are following the world and following sin, you're in for a rude awakening on that final day because you have never been converted. And the only one who is forgiven is the one who is converted. There is no cheap grace. There is no easy believism. When we come to Christ, we come to a fork in the road. And we can't play all the ends into the middle and have one foot in the world and one foot in the church and, oh yeah, and I want my forgiveness too. When you come to that intersection, it is all or nothing. And when you commit yourself to Christ, you are forsaking the world and forsaking the pursuit of a life of sin. And it is then that forgiveness is bestowed upon you. And not everyone who's talking about heaven is going there. And not everyone who thinks they have the forgiveness of sin has it. Because quite frankly, they've never been converted. And so I want us to look today at suddenly converted. I want us to see what it looks like when someone is converted under the power of God. And the radical transformation and the radical change this makes in their lives. And this is here as a microcosm of every conversion. So I want you to note four things with me as we look at verses 13 and 14. And trust me, we have a lot to look at here. I want you to see in verse 13 the seeking Savior. And then in verse 14, I want you to see the shameful sinner. 
And then third, I want you to see in verse 14, the surprising summons. And then finally, the sudden surrender. First, note the seeking Savior in verse 13. I love the Gospel of Mark already because I love to see our Lord busy serving God. It has an effect of pulling the best out of all of us as we would seek to serve the Lord as well. Notice verse 13, And He went out again by the seashore, and all the people were coming to Him, and He was teaching them. Do you see the very first word, and? You say, well, what can you bring out about the word and? Well, I want you to note, this word and serves really as a synonym for the other key word, immediately. And what this word and does is it tightly connects all of these gospel narratives such that there is a close association between what preceded and now what follows and there is no grass growing under the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. And having in verses 1 through 12, having healed the paralytic and having proclaimed the forgiveness of sin, we come now to verse 13, and He went out again. There is no downtime here. There is no wasted time. This, his life is being lived out in a rapid-fire succession. This is continuous action. And it's not limited to right here. Let me just show you in chapter 1 just so that you can see this. Turn the page back to begin chapter 1. And look at verse 12 and 13. Immediately the Spirit impelled him to go out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted. The word and at the beginning of verse 13 tells us that this is all tightly connected and there is no gap, there is no parentheses in time. This is all a very concentrated time of full following after the will of God. Look at verse 17. And Jesus said to them, Follow Me and I will make you fishers of men. Verse 18. Immediately. Come down, if you would, to verse 25. And as soon as this demon said, I know who you are, the Holy One of God, in verse 24, and Jesus rebuked him. Those words were still in the air. And Jesus immediately rebuked the devil because there was a sense of immediacy about his life and a press about what he had come to do. Verse 28 begins immediately. Verse 29, and immediately after they came out of the synagogue. Verse 31, and. Verse 33, and. Verse 34, and. Verse 40, and. Verse 43, and. We come to chapter 2, verse 2, and. Verse 12, and. Verse 13, and. Verse 15, and. Verse 17, and. Verse 19, and. Verse 23, and. Verse 25, and. Jesus was not a couch potato. Jesus was not a sluggard. Jesus was not a slackard. Jesus was Spirit-filled, and a Spirit-filled man and woman don't just sit still. They are engaged in moving out to serve God in this world. And we are created in the image of God, and part of that image is to work and to serve God and to do that which glorifies and honors God. And so as we read of the earthly ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, each of these verses that begin with the word and, it ties a tight knot between the preceding verse and this verse, and there is no lag time. Do you sense that about your own life? Do you sense the press of eternity? Do you sense what Jesus said? Nighttime is coming when no man can do the Lord's work. Let us serve God while it is day. I want you to know there's a final day that is coming. And whatever we're going to do for God, we must do so today. I want to tell you again, tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is God's day. 
and how busy we must be about doing God's work today. Boast not yourself of tomorrow, for you know not what a day may bring forth. What we know to do and can do today, we must do today for the glory of God. So look at verse 13. And he went out again. Again, there is this. He is actively a seeking Savior. He is pressing forward again. He was always going out again. Always launching out to fish for men and to reach for souls. He was always initiating. He was always serving. He was always moving out for God. Again and again and again. By the seashore. Referring to the Sea of Galilee. He is walking along the shoreline. It is this very place, the shoreline at Capernaum, where He had previously called James and John and Simon and Andrew. And notice all the people were coming to Him. The verb tense here indicates that they just kept on coming and would not stop coming. There was a continual flow of people as they came in a steady stream. Waves of people were coming. And in response to this, and He was teaching, same verb tense, He just kept on teaching and teaching and proclaiming and explaining and expositing and and instructing. He is the seeking Savior. He is not a still Savior. He is not a passive Savior. He is a seeking Savior who has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And if you and I are to follow Christ, for some of us, we're going to have to pick up the pace. If we're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ in His ministry, then we need to be moving out. And there are many of you here today who are already moving out. And this is not intended to make you feel guilty because there is already a pace about your life that is admirable to God. You're already doing it. But we could not gather this many Christians together in one place without there being some others who, quite frankly, have become a little bit of dead weight. And you need to pick up the pace. And you need to get with it in making an impact on this world for Jesus Christ. What was Jesus teaching? Jesus was teaching what He was always teaching. Chapter 1, verse 14 and 15, He tells us what He was preaching. He was preaching the Gospel of God. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. This was no time to have a little horizontal series going on of man-centered felt needs. This was a time to bring an eternal message of impact. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The word gospel means good news. It's the good news of salvation. It is God's way of salvation, not man's way of salvation, not man's way of good works, not man's way of self-righteousness, but God's way of grace. Man's way is to always reach up to God and try to pull himself up with his own religion. God's way of salvation is for God to reach down to sinful man and by His grace to pull us up. This is the seeking Savior. And we need to be busy about our Father's business as well. Second, I want you to see the shameful sinner in verse 14. The shameful sinner. Sinner, I want you to see this block of marble. I want you to see this marred piece of marble, this flawed marble that the Lord 
saw that he could make something of this life. And so it says, as he passed by. (laughs) He's on the move, folks. He was passing by, going from one teaching ministry to another teaching ministry, having impact in this world, not shuffling around. He was passing by, and it says, He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. And the reason Jesus saw him is because Jesus was looking for him. Just like Jesus saw Zacchaeus in the sycamore tree, in the midst of the crowd, Jesus sees the individual and He sees those for whom He is looking. And He saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth. Levi, who is Matthew, was probably... In his his tax booth, he was in his tax booth, which was a raised platform, and there would be a booth on top of a platform with a chair behind it, and he is sitting there, and it is probably located on a major highway that ran by the seashore that connected Damascus with the Mediterranean Sea, and it had to come through Capernaum. And so Levi is one who has shamefully sold his soul to the Roman government. He is a fellow Jew who offered himself to the highest bidder in the Roman government that he could attain the franchise to rake in the tax on this highway here in Capernaum, which was a major caravan highway. And nothing could go down this road in or out without him skimming off the top. There would be export tax for anything that left Capernaum. There was import tax for anything that came into Capernaum. And anything that was passing through, Matthew had his cut of the pie. And here he is with a bird nest on the ground. He has this tax franchise. And he is making money without even having to lift a finger. And there is no paper trail. And it is subject to all kinds of abuse and all kinds of extortion and all kinds of bribing. And you can take whatever it is, you can turn someone upside down and shake them and get as much money out of them as you possibly can. And you have no recourse. And think of the abuse that was going on and all Rome cared about was they got their cut. You can keep whatever else you can get. And that's Matthew. Flawed. Marred. Defiled. And out of this entire vast crowd, Jesus saw Levi. He picked him out. Spotted him. Because he was looking for him. There he is, sitting in this tax booth, sitting in sin, sitting in worldliness, sitting in greed, sitting in unbelief, right where you were sitting when the Lord found you. I want you to notice third the surprising summons. Because we read in verse 14, and He said to him, Jesus said to Levi. Jesus called him out publicly. Jesus singled him out in front of the crowd that day. And the others there that day must have thought, well, finally an end to the injustice. Jesus is going to do something. Surely Jesus will scold him. Surely Jesus will repudiate him. Surely Jesus will turn him upside down and shake those same coins back out of his pocket back into our pocket. But I want you to notice the surprising summons because that's not what Jesus said. Instead of telling him to go to hell, Jesus said, you're coming with me to heaven. And 
he said to him, follow me. I want you to know Levi was the last person in that whole town they would have expected to hear Jesus say this. Follow me. Follow me to prison. Follow me to, to judgment. No, they understood. I want you to become one of my followers. I want you to attach yourself to me. I want you to be the object of my grace and my mercy. And I want you to serve me the rest of your life. It's in the present tense, follow me, which carries the idea, I want you to follow me now, and I want you to be always following me every moment of every day. This is a lifestyle. This is not a one-time little decision. You walk forward, sign a card, and go back to your sin. No, I want you to be every moment of every day a follower of me, and it's in the imperative mood, which means this is a divine commandment. It is a summons. It is binding upon on your life. I am asserting my divine and sovereign authority upon you. You follow me. There is no option. There is no other choice for your life. It is all over. You follow me. This is what it means to be a Christian. It is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Not a follower of a church. Not the follower of a pastor. Not the follower of religion or of ritual or of rules. But to become a follower of the person of Jesus Christ. It is to enter into a personal relationship with Him and you become converted. It becomes a turning point in your life And you change life direction. Implied in these two words, follow me, is the invitation of the only saving gospel there is. Implied in these two words, follow me, is both repentance and faith. Repentance is certainly here. Follow me. In other words, you can't stay sitting in your unbelief. You can't stay here sitting in your greed and in your worldliness You're going to have to get up and leave a life of sin behind. You're going to have to change your priorities. You're going to have to change your pursuits. You cannot stay here and live in your sin and be a follower of Me. I'm not going to follow you. You're going to follow Me. Or you're not going to follow at all. Inherent in this is the call for repentance. And the issue is not vocation. And the issue is not geography. And the issue is not real estate being in this particular place. When he says, follow me, he's not talking about so much his feet as he is his heart. And this is where the gospel invitation comes to you, my friend. You're going to have to leave whatever it is you're in And to get up and leave it all behind. You may get to keep the same job and you may get to live in the same house, but it just won't be your house anymore. It will be His house. And it's not going to be your business anymore. It's going to be His business. Also implied in this is saving faith. You understand what saving faith is, don't you? Jesus is saying here when He says, follow Me, you must commit yourself to Me. There's nothing here about walking forward. There's nothing here about signing a card. There's nothing here about giving a dead testimony. He is saying you must attach yourself to Me and submit your life to Me and surrender yourself to Me and enter into a personal relationship It's all over for your little life. And a new life is going to begin. And you'll never be the same again because you're going to be moving out with me. 
You will travel with me. You will eat with me. You will sit at my feet. You will listen to my words. You will obey my teaching. And along the way, you will grow to know me deeper and fuller. And you will grow to love me. And you will look to me for everything. And you will learn to trust me. And wherever I go, you go. And whatever I say to do, that's what you will do. In short, your old life is over. Follow me. That's what the issue of the Gospel is. The invitation of the Gospel Follow me. This invitation, really this summons, brought Levi to a major intersection in his life. This was a fork in the road for Levi, just like it's a fork in the road for every single one of us here today. And Levi is going to have to do some quick accounting inside his head. Do I want to stay here in my little old tax booth? Do I want to stay here and sit in my arrogant sin? Do I want to stay here in my miserable greed? Do I want to stay here in my little old world? Or do I want to get up and walk away from it all? Do I want to get up and follow after Jesus Christ? Which way will it be? And for Levi, and for all of us here today, it can't be both ways. Levi couldn't keep one foot in the tax booth and with the other foot follow after Christ. It was an all or nothing proposition. This is where the Gospel brings every single one of us. And it is surprising and it is shocking and it is startling. That Christ calls out to the most flawed blockheads to come follow Him. He calls out to the most marred pieces of marble and says, Follow me, and by your grace, by my grace, I will totally convert your life. I want you to see, number three, the sudden surrender. How would Levi respond? Let me ask you this. How have you responded to this point? Notice, and he got up. You know what the word and signifies here. He didn't go home and pray about it. He didn't go home and think about it. He didn't go home and weigh his books to see if he could right now afford to give his life to Christ. And, meaning immediately, right now. This is extraordinary. He got up. No doubt he had been hearing the Lord Jesus Christ teach that day. No doubt he had heard the gospel of grace. No doubt there was a conviction of sin that he was on the outside of the kingdom and he must enter into the kingdom. And no doubt God had been preparing his heart and working by his Spirit as the truth of Christ's teaching from verse 13 had brought him to this intersection And when he heard Jesus call him out publicly and call him out that day, his heart was sitting on ready and he swallowed hard and thought, my soul, he's calling out to me today and he's not stopping and he's not slowing down. He's continuing to pass on. Now is my chance. Now is my only opportunity. It's now or never. And that split second on that moment, he got up and followed after Jesus. It was a decisive response. He made a definite break with His past in answering this call. And He chose to leave it all behind. He cashed in all of His chips and walked away. And followed Him. In that moment, Matthew crossed the line. Forever He crossed the line. 
He became in that instant a follower of Jesus Christ. How exciting. I want to bring to your attention some marks of true saving faith here. I'd like to take this verse and turn it upside down and shake it and see what falls out into our hands. You know, many people say they believe. Really? Do you? Or you just say that you do? What are the marks of true saving faith? Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. There is a faith... James 2, 19, that's the faith of devils. What is true saving faith? Let me show you some marks here. It was, number one, a forsaking. True saving faith always involves a forsaking. A forsaking of sin. A forsaking of the pursuit of sin. A forsaking of the pleasure of sin a forsaking of the priority of sin. When he got up, he was forsaking his life of self-centeredness and his life of living for the things of this world. He forsook it all. This is repentance. And with the first step out of this tax booth, he was turning his back on the world in which he had lived He was forsaking. Have you forsaken? Now, you may have the same job and you may live in the same house, as I said. But have you turned your back on the world? This world that crucified Jesus Christ. Have you renounced your loyalty and allegiance to the world? There is a forsaking second. It was decisive. It was emphatic. He was determined. He was decided to follow Jesus. He was, if you will, resolved to follow after Jesus. This was a defining moment. This was a defining decision. He drove the stake down. He was decisive. And if you'd have seen him later that day and asked him what decision he had made, there would be no question whether he was in or out. I'm in. Count me in. I'm decisive about following Jesus Christ. Are you? Number three, it was personal. No one else could do this for him. No one else could step out of that tax booth for Levi but himself. It required his personal faith. Number three, it was immediate. It was a decision that was made in a split second and there was a specific point of believing. This wasn't, he didn't believe over a progressive period of time and somewhere fuzzy in there He got there. It was immediate. Number five, it was wholehearted. He knew he could not remain in his former life and follow Christ, and it required all that there is of him given to all that there is of Christ. Six, it was exclusive. There was nothing else... He could do, but faith alone in Christ alone, there's no need to be baptized here to get into the kingdom. There's no need to join the church to get into the kingdom. There's no need to do good works to get into the kingdom. There's no need to go to a priest to get into the kingdom. Exclusively, faith in Jesus Christ. Number seven. It was life-changing. This was a radical change of life direction. This wasn't just, like I said, fire insurance. This wasn't just, well, there's a new name written down up in glory. 
and you just keep living like the devil, and you just keep running with the world, and you just keep following your sin. No, he was brought to the major intersection. And he made a radical change. And you know what? God was on the other side of that coin. And it was God that was pushing from the other side of that coin that was turning him in this direction. Number eight, it was Christ directed. He didn't join a movement. He didn't join a cause. He became a follower of Christ Himself. Number nine, it was life long. For the rest of his life, he understood there was no turning back. And if you had run into Matthew six months later, a year later, and asked him, are you in or are you out? He wouldn't be wrestling with assurance. He was so decisive about his decision to follow Christ. How could he doubt what had just happened in his life? This was too radical. This was too huge. I was reading William Gurnall, the great Puritan, who wrote what Spurgeon called my second Bible, a book called The Full Armor of God. And Gurnall said at the point of conversion, how could you not know that an old king had been withdrawn and pulled down from the throne of your life and a new king had been installed as the new sovereign and lord of your life? How could you not know that had happened? That the old king is removed. And the new king is enthroned in your life. How could you not know that? How could you have doubts about that? It is so black and white. It is so revolutionary. It is so radical. This summer, I spent one of the greatest days of my life in Edinburgh, Scotland flying back from Moscow, I went to Scotland. And I spent really half a day in Scotland, in in Edinburgh. And I was privileged to receive a walking tour of Edinburgh. Not one where you would get in a bus and be driven around and things pointed out over a megaphone. But the one man in Edinburgh who knows every brick of that town better than any other human being. The curator of the library of the great Christian college there. A man who is legally blind and age 76. On his feet and on my two feet, he gave me a walking tour of Edinburgh probably the most historic town in the world for church history. And as we walked down the sidewalk, he pointed out where John Knox lived, where John Knox preached, and we stood where John Knox was buried. He pointed out to me where Robert Murray McShane lived and attended elementary school. He showed me where Horatio Bonner lived, where Eric Little ran for God and where Thomas Chalmers stood for the truth. And I remember Mr. Anderson pointing to a house. He said, let me tell you who lives in that house. There once lived in this house Sir James Simpson. He said, Mr. Simpson... Sir James Simpson made what many people believe to be the most significant discovery in the history of modern medicine. He said he turned the entire world of modern medicine upside down. He discovered the use of 
chloroform as an anesthetic in surgery that now has allowed all surgery to be performed without killing the person. And then Mr. Anderson relayed this story to me. He said in his latter years, Sir James Simpson was lecturing at Edinburgh University. And a medical student asked him, what do you consider to be the most valuable discovery of your life? And Sir James Simpson quickly answered, my most valuable discovery was when I discovered what a rotten sinner I am. And I discovered what a glorious Savior Jesus Christ is. And I wonder, have you made that discovery? Have you discovered what a rotten sinner you are? And have you discovered what a wonderful Savior Jesus Christ is? And when those two discoveries will match up in your life, you will be converted. Because there's no way you can see how rotten you are and no way that you can see how glorious He is without your running to Him for mercy. No fool, no fool would see how rotten He is and how glorious Jesus is and sit like a bump on a stump. If you're saved, it's because you've made those two discoveries. And if you yet need to be saved, may God open your eyes as He did Matthew to see what a glorious Savior is calling out to you and says, follow me. And He delights in taking rotten sinners who are so flawed and so marred and so imperfect and transforming them by His grace to make them trophies of His grace. If you've never believed upon Jesus Christ, just look into your heart and look up to Christ and you can only plead for mercy. Let us pray. Father, we thank You for the seeking Savior, Jesus Christ, who has come to seek and to save that which is lost. We thank You that He sees what others do not see, what we can become by His grace. And God, I pray that in this house today, those who are lost, would You enable them to discover this. And those who have been unresponsive to Christ, would You allow Your Son to be discovered by them that salvation might come. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.